Thanks very much. I, I feel like I've uh, taken my life into my own hands, taking you out of the sunshine in the Bay Area and brought you back inside for, uh, for, for more conversation. Today, I want to talk about another topic that's near and dear to my heart, and that is the attracting, retaining, and cultivating of women. And as we heard this morning, talent is a huge strategic driver. And I want to talk a little bit today about how we can tap into this resource, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it's actually really good for business. So I want to start with a little bit of a story about myself. And really, it's, it's just a, a few uh, vignettes that I want to give you. Not only am I a woman, which is obvious, uh, but I've also been um, a recruited woman. I've been uh, somewhat a developed woman. I haven't been as good at being a retained woman. And so I feel like I have some things to say on the matter. My first job out of grad school was, was teaching at McGill University. And um, I was married. I got pregnant. My husband lived two hours away. And so an academic job came up in that city. And I went and I applied for it. I went to my interview, eight and a half months pregnant. I am a small person. I was not so small at the time. Not one person mentioned anything to me about my physical state. And I thought to myself, this is a problem. The timing was February I or March. I was not going to be starting the academic year until September. So I would have lots of time for maternity leave. And yet I didn't get the job. And the person who got the job was a government employee. Uh, this was in Ottawa, Canada. And he had had no academic research or teaching experience. Hmm, I said to myself, too bad I was pregnant. Uh, a few years later, I went to uh, an interview at one of the big four consulting firms, and um, they said to me, well, how much are you making now as an academic? And I told them, and the next thing I knew, they offered me $4,000 less. Uh, a year later, I found out that somebody else who was more junior to me was making more money than me, and he was a man, obviously. Um, and so I said to myself, I'm a poor negotiator. I've also been harassed on the job and I haven't said anything about it. I was ashamed that it happened. I wondered what did I do to cause it and I didn't speak up. And so what all of these have in common is that I blamed myself. And I wanna point out that this was the early 1980s and in some ways not that much has changed. But one thing really changed for me, and that is I did an amazing project while I was at PwC, and I got to interview 100 pioneering and pathfinding women. And in those interviews, and these are people like the first fighter woman fighter pilot, the first woman CEO of a hospital, the first woman government minister, like really impressive women. And I saw, it's not me. It's not that I don't have talents, it's a pattern that's pervasive. And so it turned into a passion of mine to mentor, to coach, and to elevate women in the workplace. So now I want to go to a poll everywhere for you. Uh, and the question is, to what extent is your company putting an emphasis on attracting, retaining, and cultivating women? Talent is in such short supply. We talked about it this morning. Biotech is exploding. There's a ton of investment being made. So many companies are being created every day. Unemployment rates are plummeting. And there's been a renewed emphasis on diversity and inclusion and the importance and business case for having diverse workforces. And yet, we still have a problem. Women make up 50% of the population. And not only that, women make up 50% of the grad students in biology. So if that's the case, why are we finding that women, less than 25% of women, hold tech jobs, either high tech or biotech? And it gets worse from there. 
only 18% of companies have women in leadership roles in STEM. I want to talk today about a little bit about unconscious bias. We see what we are looking for. We take in, as human beings, so much information that unconsciously our brains categorize that so that when we see a person, that means something. I don't know you at all, but I might unconsciously be thinking some things about you, but it happens unconsciously and we're not even aware of it. So a lot of people talk about gender bias and I want, I'm here to say, men are not evil and nefarious, um, and that it is a matter of being unconscious about it or not being educated about it. We see what we're looking for. How many people took undergrad psychology? Okay, how many people have seen this picture before? Okay, so I don't need to tell you, I don't need to go through the drill. Some people see an old woman, some people see a young woman. And it's only when you're being, when you've been told that the other is also true that you can see both. And what often happens is that we only see what we're looking for. It's confirmation bias. What are some of the consequences of confirmation bias? Well, there are a lot of urban legends about women and about what women are like and what women at work are like. What are some of those urban legends? What are some of those typologies of women at work? Too emotional. She probably has to take care of her family. She's going to have to take care of her family. So like, how can we put her on this assignment? Let's say it's, it will require a lot of travel. So here are three key ones. The first one, women are great at taking care of the team because women are nurturing and lovely and wonderful. One of the things that's happening in high tech right now is women are being targeted to be team managers and recruiters for teams, and the men are the ones who are doing the technical work. And we'll talk about why that creates a problem later on. That's Rosie the Riveter, who was uh, the archetype of the Second World War. And I can't tell you how many men have said to me, if we have a difficult job to do, let's give it to a woman, she'll get it done. Women can multitask. There's only one problem with this stereotype. When the job is done, the woman is not necessarily the one that gets the promotion. She may even lose her job. And that's what happened to the Rosies. And then finally, I do a lot of coaching of executives, men and women. I can't tell you how many times I have been told that a woman has sharp elbows. In all of my coaching of men, I have never been told that a woman has sharp elbows. And I even have one, ex one example that I, that I was thinking of. Um, I was working uh, as a coach for a, a women's program for a global organization. It's got about 80,000 employees. And these were the high potential women who were already leaders and were going to be elevated to a new level of leadership. This woman's boss said to me, you need to talk to her about the feedback she got. And I said, well, what feedback did she get? And he said, she's got sharp elbows. And I went, Okay, and what does that mean? He said, well, you ask her, she'll know. And so then I, I asked her and she said, well, what do you mean sharp elbows? I have, like, why do I have sharp elbows? Like, why am I different than any of the men that work here? So then we had to have a call together because I was working remotely and the three of us were on the call. And so I said, okay, Jim, would you please explain to Darcy what this whole thing about sharp elbows means. And so he went and he said, well, you know, people feel you're, you're a little, like you're a little aggressive and uh, you, you don't go, you're not, you're not really involved in providing like nice talk and et cetera and so forth. So I got really curious. I said, okay, so is there somebody who is kind of Darcy's equal, who's a guy like equally capable? He goes, oh yeah, sure, Chris. I said, okay, can you please describe Chris? He's a go-getter. He knows how to get things done. He's task-oriented. He's focused on objectives. And I went, okay, so let's look at this. And um, it ended up resulting in Jim realizing that he had unconscious bias. 
And the next thing I knew, I got feedback that he had he had initiated a call with all of the women in this women's initiative program to talk to them about his experience of realizing that he had unconscious bias. I want to talk today about three critical components that I believe will make the difference. External brand, culture, and EVP, which stands for Employee Value Proposition. There are some evocative brands. Brands are the promise that a company makes to its shareholders and to its customers or clients. Each of those brands evokes an idea. When people are applying for jobs, there, some people are thinking about what is the brand of the company that I'm going to? I can't tell you how many people have said to me, young people have said to me, young adults, I want to go to Google. It's so cool. They have no idea what the culture is at Google. They have no idea what the experiences of employees that work there. But they really do, even the people who work at Google love to say they work at Google. And so that is the prime, that's the first attraction that people have to a company is what it's known for, what promise it's made to the external world. But that's only going to get them interested. It's not really enough. So let's talk a little bit about the next component, which is culture. What is culture? Often we confuse it with climate, which is how people feel about working in a place. Uh, but culture involves so many things, and it starts with the expressed values of the company, so how they're going to treat each other. The problem with value statements is that often they're not at all linked to behavior. So I have a client that the first value that they have on their list of values, which is on the wall, is integrity. This is a company that is so toxic, people will throw each other under the bus to protect themselves. They triangulate, so I'll talk to you about you, but I won't tell you how I'm feeling about you. And so integrity means nothing in that context. And what a lot of companies fail to do is they fail to say, if that is our value, what are the behaviors that we are expecting that we will reinforce, that we will um, reward? Um, and what are the behaviors that are not acceptable? So one of, the, one of the words that's used uh, that women are looking for is a culture of inclusion. Women are also looking for cultures where there's a high level of trust. And that's something that came up this morning as well. When people do what they say they're going to do. One of my colleagues um, has written a number of books on trust. His name's Charlie Green, and he's got something called the trust equation. And um, it's following through on what you say you're going to do, being dependable, and having very low self-interest. So very often, women are looking for collaborative cultures where they can trust the people around them and where they're going to be working together in teams. Any other characteristics of culture that are attractive to most women? That they're part of the decision-making, that they see themselves represented. Collaborative, very important for women. Absolutely. Flexibility, extremely important. And it's, a, and it's also a culture where there's psychological safety, where people feel like they can have conversations about what it's like for them, whether they're a woman, whether they're a man, whether they're from another un, uh, underrepresented group. So here's the model. Great cultures are characterized by five things. The first is leaders as champions. I had my first experience of this, but in the early 1990s, there was a CEO at one of the, lar one of the big four consulting firms. I was consulting to that firm, and I was uh, actually the executive coach of one of the people that reported to him. And this guy uh, was the best leader I had ever met, um, the guy that I was coaching. And I was wondering, why am I coaching him? But he was extremely humble. He was extremely supportive of women. He was incredibly careful with the language that he used around and about women. 
His purpose was to elevate women in that organization. And he wasn't doing it because it was socially correct. He was doing it because he believed it was the right thing to do. So I said to him, you know, Bob, how did, how did you become so fantastic? And he said, it was the women's initiative. And it was the women's initiative at Deloitte. It was the first women's initiative that I had heard of in the U.S. And that initiative was championed by the CEO of the company. Uh, his name was Mike Cook. He walked into the office one day and he looked around and he said, I have three teenage daughters. There are a lot of women starting in this company, but there's no women at the most senior leadership levels. What's going on? And so he engaged a firm to come and uh, create a series of experiences. And those experiences were every partner had to attend, but women were there and it was, it was constructed as a safe environment where women talked about what it was to be a woman at Deloitte, what it was like when the guys all went out for lunch and didn't invite the female teammate. What was it like when uh, the junior guy went golfing with the partner and the woman went, I don't golf. What was it like when the um, team building activity one day was hiking and there was a pregnant woman and she was told, well, that's too bad. Maybe you could get your nails done at the hotel. And then there was a lot of tears because one of the things women are more likely to do than men is to cry. And I have a lot of experience with that um, at, um, at a, an accelerator that I'm working at called Ad Astra. And I think every time we have a meeting, women are crying, um, but for good reason. Um, so what happened was that the men that went through this program came to realize what it was like to be a woman. They could put themselves in the shoes of their female colleagues and the women that reported to them. And it changed them. It changed the way they talked about women, the way they thought about women. And the, the off offshoot of that is more women were promoted. They also did a great job of measuring. They looked at how many women do we have now, then we do the program, and then how many women do we have later. One of the offshoots of that first program was that they created a development program for high potential women. And, um, and that those women were taken away uh, not not uh, put into prison or anything, but they were taken away and developed. So they got um, <clears throat> they were assessed, um, and they each had an individual development program that was done for them. But only because the leaders really had skin in the game, and they made sure everybody else did too. I already mentioned clear values and behaviors. It doesn't matter what your values are if your behaviors are not aligned with those, and if your behaviors are not inclusive. Align policies and processes. I mentioned a moment ago that in the high tech world of machine learning, uh, women are the ones who create the teams and nurture the teams and um, develop the team members. And very often men are the ones that are doing the coding. The problem is when you come to um, um, the way people are paid, people who do coding get paid more than people who manage teams. And so the women are put not only at a disadvantage technically, but they also are making less money. And it's all kinds of policies. It's leave policy. It's um, performance review policy, as we just mentioned. Development and career paths. For, I would say, since the late 1990s until very recently, People, uh, women, uh, there were affinity groups created for women and for other minority groups. There were separate development programs for these people. Women needed to learn to develop certain kinds of skills that they didn't get, whether it was because of their biology and it didn't come naturally or because of their socialization. And so they were put through training on self-awareness, on negotiating skills, on networking, um, on executive presence. I can't tell you how many times I was asked by the people that hired me to tell a woman that they, she wasn't dressing appropriately. And I would look at her and I would go, she looks appropriate to me. Or I would be told to, that, to, to ask her to change her hair. 
Um, at one consulting firm that I worked at, I was um, coaching some women who were coming up for partner and all of the women with long hair started to wear their hair in a bun for a year, at least a year before they entered the partner track because women with long hair were not getting, uh, were not successfully being made partners, but women with buns were. So it's just whatever. And I want you to know that that was recent. So executive bias, I mean, unconscious bias still reigns. The funniest was when somebody asked me to ask one of their um, people to cut their hair because their hair was looking unruly. And it was before the days of Facebook or LinkedIn. And they had no idea what I looked like. But at the time, my hair wasn't quite as managed as it is now. Uh, but still, it was kind of like going out all over the place. And I was supposed to tell her to change her hair. Also, it's extremely important to have clear career paths, but to have alternative types of career paths. Not everybody wants to be a leader. And often women who are juggling families, either children or uh, elderly parents or ill relatives, women are still the primary caretakers and uh, they might need more flexibility as Robin said earlier. And finally, I recently last year did a study of, a, I interviewed about 20, 25 women leaders. I was really curious about what was it that made, that contributed to their success. And there was one factor that was common to all of them. And that factor was they all had a mentor. And that mentor was somebody who believed in them, who introduced them to the right people, who removed roadblocks, who believed that they could, that this, these women could do things that the women did themselves did not believe they could do. Because one of the tendencies of women and ingrained behavior is women seem to come up across as less confident and less willing to jump off the diving board to try something because they don't feel they have the, um, the, the skill to do that. But it's not just about assigning mentors. It's also about developing the mentors as mentors because often people don't even know what that role means. And one of, the, one of my clients uh, in one global organization has a mentor and the calls are bizarre because the mentor has no, he's great, he's the CEO and she's very lucky she's got him except he has no idea what it means to mentor her and uh, she's not really getting very much out of it. And it is all about creating a mentality, which is part of culture, of people believing that it's gratifying to elevate the behavior of others. So at any level in the organization, people can exhibit leadership and mentorship, and it's all about elevating others. And when organizations come to realize that, they become extremely attractive because not only do people want to be developed, uh, but it also uh, creates feelings of being part of something bigger. Now I want to talk about the employee value proposition. So we've got the brand, which is the external promise. We've got the culture, which is the internal promise. And we've got the employee value proposition, which is the experience of employees. The employee value proposition is something that is um, that I worked on with one company called Zap Labs. They do not have a sexy company. They're creating software for realtors. It's very hard to get talent. It's bore. It, it seems boring. So they had. <laughs> I tried to make it a little bit more exciting. So what they did is they hired uh, our firm to come in and try and help them create some kind of explanation of the wonderful experience that it is to work in their company. What makes their company unique? What makes their company an attractive place for people to work? I'm sorry, you've got my back. Um, and, um, and often when, when organizations develop these, they use a marketing firm. And the marketing firm comes up with some quick little hit. Uh, but what we did with them is we created a diverse design team. That design team went out and it interviewed their, they interviewed their friends and they question that they, they asked their friends was, friends in other companies, what do you love about what you, where you work? 
What do you wish was different? And what might Zap do to entice you to leave where you are and come to us? And they did that research and they, um, they came back together. They created a, an employee value proposition draft, posted it up everywhere they could, post-its and Sharpies everywhere. And people in those public areas just wrote comments, made changes. And um, <clears throat> ultimately, they came up with the statement of what made it unique to work there and how, why it was so fabulous. The people who asked me to do that were not the employees. It was the new CEO and his executive team because they recognized that they had a horrible problem with recruiting talent. And then the, but what was really interesting was the elements of the employee value proposition then became elements of other parts of the HR policy and became other parts of how people were rewarded um, and became part of the fabric of that company. Deloitte did a study about what uh, employees value most. Um, and, it's, and these are the kinds of things that need to get reflected in an employee value proposition. A feeling that you're doing meaningful work. Well, in biotech, that's not a problem. Supportive management. That's both people who are uh, approachable, uh, where, pe where they're, the people who report to them are not afraid to ask questions, where those individuals give guidance and clear expectations. A positive work environment where people are happy to be there. I have worked in, I, as a consultant in many organizations. There are some organizations where you can see that people are truly happy. They greet each other in the hallway. They smile. They have personal things up in their cubicles. Um, I recently came back from, um, DC where I'm working with a client, they've completely restructured their physical space. They have all these great public areas, kit kitchens, just like Google, but unlike Google, they don't have any food on the tables. Nobody uses those tables because it's actually not a very positive work environment and everybody's trying to hide. So we did a little experiment and we sat and we had a, a consulting meeting at one of those tables on one of the floors and everybody that walked by made a comment. Um, and so, uh, you know, wow, don't you have an office? I said, yes, I have an office. Well, aren't you like uncomfortable working in public? I'm, no, I'm not. So positive work environment, both physical and emotional. Growth opportunities, but people, it doesn't have to be just that they exist, they have to be made explicit to people. Here are your career paths. Here is how you can grow. Here's a here is a way in which you can try something or partner with somebody or go to a meeting with somebody that maybe you have no business being at, but you'll learn a heck of a lot being there. And so it's looking for what are those development opportunities. And then finally, trust in leadership. Leadership is key. We often hire leaders based on charisma, that can-do attitude, people who look right, and unfortunately, sometimes those are not the right leaders. So we have to be careful about recruiting leaders, but also developing them. Leaders have to have self-awareness, they have to have awareness of how they impact other people, they have to have skill at communicating, many other things, and if they don't have them, they need to be developed. So what I'm gonna ask you to do now is take a moment and think about it. For your company, what is one short phrase that you wish was there to describe the employee value proposition? And they're gonna keep rolling in. So the interesting thing that happened at Zap Labs was a lot of the initial ideas about an employee value proposition, when they went to talk to their friends and their friends talked about their own, their companies where they work, a lot of those were table stakes. They were common to all of the tech companies. And so it's really important to think about what makes your environment unique. We hear you. 
respect, encourage, grow, thrive, um, success. You matter, a defined company vision. Employees can be at their best each day. This is uh, not the official value proposition for Cisco, but I think it speaks wonders and it's unique to that CEO. I choose Cisco because the CEO supports innovative ideas even from interns. But it's thinking about what is something that makes it unique and how do you describe that? So in um, Zap Lab ended up doing cartoons. Instead of using words, they ended up with cartoons that demonstrated just what the different parts of their value proposition were. So I wanna just uh, recap. In terms of attraction, there are a number of companies that are doing really important things Amgen has done a, uh, an internal search of themselves to figure out what do they need to do to make their company a better place for women. GoDaddy, you might wonder why that one's up there because it had such a horrible reputation. Um, in 2014, there were only 14% of uh, the company was women. It was a totally bro culture. The CEO and his executive team realized that they had a terrible problem. They started to have conversations with the women that were working there. They started to have conversations out in public. And uh, at this time, they now have 40% of their employees are women. That's a huge difference in a short period of time. And they're not just playing lip service to the numbers. They're also trying to continuously reinvigorate their culture to support women. JP Morgan Chase and company have uh, invested millions of dollars to women on the move. And GE has their goal for 2020, which is 20,000 women in STEM roles. In terms of retaining, it's cr critically important to lead by example. When people come in uh, for an interview, they very quickly realize that what is said in public about the company is not necessarily what's true inside the building. And given that there is such a race for talent, and you know, Robin mentioned uh, at the San Diego meeting that for every candidate, there are four jobs and you gotta be fast. So you gotta be fast. You also have to have an, a, a experience of integrity. You're gonna be more attractive if the leaders are leading by example and they're behaving in a way that the women find attractive and inclusive when they're being interviewed. You need to provide flexibility and support. So not just flexible work schedules, work from everywhere. Um, I know somebody who's at Intel and she's super busy, she's working on autonomous driving, and she can take, if her car needs maintenance or if it's been in an accident, she takes her car to the Intel garage and it is fixed. The problem with the support is that often companies create support mechanisms for what they think their employees want. You need to ask them. Design inclusive policies and procedures, and we talked about those, whether those are leave or benefits, or performance review, and create a dedicated space to connect and share experiences. That's a dedicated space for women where they can share their experiences because although it's incumbent on organizations to make changes, women also need to process and develop as well. And in terms of cultivating, mentor programs with experienced mentors, um, and when there aren't mentors inside the company, find mentors outside the company. For example, I'm working with someone from a global biotech company. We are working unofficially. I am not getting paid. I met her at a networking event. She's moving up very quickly in the organization and she has no one to talk to about her career, about what to do in her new role, etc. It's very, e it's, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's important to create mentorship and sometimes it's gotta be external to the company. At Ad Astra, the, the the uh, accelerator told you about before, they have about 50 um, external mentors that they're brought in as people need them. Develop and networking. The network is everything. 
organizations often don't um, cultivate their external network of alumni. And that's incredibly important. It's an incredibly important uh, pipeline for new talent, but also providing women with the skills and the introductions so that they have a network inside their company and inside the industry. And finally, I believe that leaders rock, but it's incredibly important that leaders have in their head, rationally and in their heart, emotionally, why it's important for them to retain and elevate women. So finally, I want to ask one more question. What's the most important thing your company can focus on to retrain and cultivate women? Fabulous. So keep those in mind as you go back to your company. And I want to show one more quote. If I had a daughter, I would not let her become an engineer because the world isn't ready for her yet. HR has an incredibly strategic role in ensuring that the world is ready. So thank you very much.